And the difference between an LT1 and LT2 is pretty extensive. Okay. Basically, combustion system okay. architecture is identical. So how the yeah. air and the fuel mix together, yeah. that remains largely unchanged. Valve train system, you know, together uh, with the, you know, the lifters, AFM, um, piston topography, that's all common. Okay. Cylinder head, that's also the, largely the same except for some other s slight adjustments, but uh, largely the same casting, um, same basic details. From there, almost everything is new. Really? Oh, um, interesting. As I mentioned before, like, engine's now an inch lower. Right. So pan is shallower yeah. um, by an inch, basically moving everything up forward. Um, talked about the, the lube system that make this thing capable. Right. Um, we've re-engineered the dry sump tank. Before it was that long cylinder. Mm -hmm made out of aluminum. Um, now it's composite and as you can see direct mounted. This allows us to get rid of the hoses, um, extra you know complexity. Um, obviously then you get extra oil they can't really even use in the system. Right. That's all mass. And by going to this uh, you know composite nylon we've got a lot of new features in here. Uh, additional uh, separation devices, okay. a, a centrifuge here that allows us to get some of the air out. Like a, like a PCV? It's similar. Yeah. Um, so that when the um, oil is pulled out of the engine, uh -huh. it kind of spirals down, allows some of the, oil, the air to separate. Get a nice high quality oil reservoir here where the oil is pulled back in. To that point exactly, you can see here. Um, so different uh, LT1, LT2 is now we have one, two, oh, wow. three scavenge pumps. Yeah. yeah. Um, these two work basically as part of the pump assembly. This is the supply pump. Okay. Um, like the LT1, it's a it's a variable uh, displacement. Right. So that allows us to control the exact amount of oil flow out to portions of the engine. Um, these two uh, scavenge pumps, they harvest the oil from the uh, the sump here. Mm -hmm. One does uh, the bays one and four. The other does cylinder bays two and three. And obviously this third one um, harvests the oil from the valley. This one is absolutely critical um, to our overall function. One of the other major differences is now the engine block is completely separated the top of the engine from the lower. Right. So all the oil that is in the overhead now drains down into the valley. Right. And basically it, it pulls there. I kind of like to call this oil pump north or oil pan north, if right. you will. Before we would have openings in here that would allow the oil to drain. Mm -hmm. But uh, and when you look at the engine when it wasn't running, it would look like there's like some nice big openings. Yeah. But if you imagine what happens if you're spinning, you know, camshaft spins half the speed of the engine, but say it's 3,000 RPM, it looks like a cylinder. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that's that oil man. would drip on it, get flung around. Yeah. You know, that's parasitic loss and it's just bad for oil, it traps air in it, all that stuff. Um, so now we block that off. That oil that collects here, we, we pull out using this scavenge pump, basically pump it out to the reservoir where the other uh, oil is provided, and we get a really nice clean oil um, as a result. In terms of like long-term testing, like with blow-by, I'm assuming that it's not really a problem because you have all these scavenging pumps. Yeah, of course, we do rigorous testing. Blow-by is a, a huge factor overall to the ventilation. Yeah. If you don't control the, the rings and you get a lot of extra combustion gas into the chamber, High, because uh, if you have high pressure in your crankcase, mm -hmm. don't forget if you're if you're spinning the engine, if you have 6.2 liter engine, not only do you have 6.2 liters of air above the piston, mm -hmm. you have 6.2 liters of air moving below the piston. Yeah. So whatever uh, residual gases you have in the chamber, if you have a lot of blow by, you can have higher pressure. That's all parasitic losses while you move that air around within the, the block. So by having these, you know, having, you know, really superior ring control, controlling blow by, and then with the scavenge system to harvest those gases, get them out of the case, you know, you get additional benefits. Really, uh, you know, the engine responds very well if you can kind of give it a more of a free state to spin. Okay, what did we do for power? Um, so cam is a huge part of that, but mm -hmm. let me kind of start more with the basics. Moving the engine to the back mm -hmm. opened up a lot of real estate actually. Although we lowered the engine down, um, not having to look over the engine now means that we can make it taller. Mm -hmm. If uh, kind of like Mike was describing, like uh, when we put one of these in a, in a C7, like it, it's a knock, yeah. it's kind of blocking your whole view. But uh, so now we were able to increase the height of the manifold. Um, so for we were able to now on the LT2 make all uh, equal length runners. Right. Um, and basically oh, have wow, a, you know, it's kind of a runner in the box design. And uh, we were able to balance out all the cylinders with those equal runners. 
kind of improved the flow through the manifold itself, gained several percent uh, power improvement just uh, with the manifold alone. That obviously is, is also works in tandem with the exhaust. Um, can't eat if you can't poop kind of right. routine. So these headers uh, are also worth an additional uh, percent improvement uh, in overall flow. They don't just look cool, they, they work extremely well. You know, all of that you know, is, is great in harmony, but uh, we also need the camshaft to kind of take advantage of those principles. Um, and the biggest change there is the exhaust lift is, is gone up a, a full millimeter. So now oh, both really? the intake and exhaust are, are both 14 millimeter lift. The, uh, the overall overlap, et cetera, um, just kind of get that extra breathing. All that harmonizes together, and that's what gets us that uh, 35 horsepower increase uh, for LT2. Interesting. You can kind of see, um, and you're right, some of the fundamentals. Of, you can see first and foremost the throttle bodies pointing in the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, and obviously, the uh, the exhaust instead of sweeping down, mm -hmm. they sweeping sweep up. up. Yeah. Um, one additional challenge that offers is if you notice on LT1, we have covers over them, but the mm -hmm. ignition coils mm -hmm. used to be mounted up high. Mm -hmm. Now it's too hot up here because of the exhaust. So, you move them so down now we uh, we yeah. see we have them mounted down low. Um, so obviously that that's a, another change to uh, make sure we compensate for that. As I mentioned, that to to mate directly to the the uh, DC. Um, the transaxle, we, you know, that's primary, another reason why we had to lower it down, so we could have direct connection. So and that's why you see such a thin sump down here for right. that, uh, for that position. Of the what size is the throttle body? Uh, that's an 87 millimeter throttle body. Oh, really? So it's so it's basically a stock throttle yeah, body from LT1. Yeah, I should have included that as another component that is actually carryover from LT1. If you were to go 92 millimeters, I mean. We, most of the work we do when we're evaluating the influence of various components is yeah. we, we do that through like virtual testing. Uh -huh. um, so we, we would know basically what impact uh, having various size throttle body would have on performance. Okay. So like obviously that, that limits the amount of hardware testing we would need to do. Yeah. If something is in an area where we want to expand our models, then we'll do a component test of course and right. evaluate it. Um, so obviously all that was on the table when we were right. looking at this process. Cool.